Welcome to another edition of the Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs. This is our 108th show. As you can tell, my voice is a little scratchy today. I've got bad allergies. Today's guest is best-selling author Jay Samet of Future Proofing You and Ironically, Jay and I actually, we didn't know this before this show, actually went to camp together when we were six years old at a camp called Camp Arthur outside of Philadelphia that doesn't exist anymore. Jay, welcome. Thank you for having me, Mark. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you today. Could you please give us a little bit about your professional background, which is really um, very interesting, and you've been amazingly successful. Um. Serial tech entrepreneur, uh, got lucky to start in the internet before anybody knew what it was in the 1970s and PCs in the beginning and worked with guys like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and Paul Allen and, and Elon Musk and everything. And you wake up one day and dozens of friends become billionaires and you notice a pattern. And I noticed that you can teach it. And so after selling companies, and I mean, I was independent vice chairman of Deloitte, you know, companies with hundreds of thousands of employees like Sony and, and little startups uh, like pre-IPO uh, LinkedIn. I've been spending the past decade teaching at the university level how to build high-tech startups. I've had students do $100 million in a semester and uh, drop out of school. Um, and uh, so I wrote these books to help people live their dreams. Uh, and, and so you um, were born in Philadelphia. Where did you grow up in Philly? Um, I went to in Cheltenham, went to school in Cheltenham, and then in uh, junior high school, moved out to California. Uh, your dad took a job out there? Uh, yeah. And why did you write this book and pick this particular title? Um, so my first book, Disrupt You, um, really had said everything that I thought I could teach people. And I got emails, as I was telling you, from over 140 countries. It's in over a dozen languages. But I got this one email that just bugged the crap out of me. Most emails are, you know, thank you, this helped me. And, and they share their success story. And this one said, this is all motivational, but I could never do it. And it was from a millennial. And I didn't understand why I couldn't connect with that generation. So I came up with this crazy idea for future proofing you. What if I took a homeless immigrant with no support network who grew up on welfare and mentored him one day a week for a year? I gave him no business contacts. I gave him no capital. And I didn't tell him what business to start. He had to start something that didn't take any money. And spoiler alert, if you're reading future proofing you, he becomes a self-made millionaire in under a year. So I synthesized that down to what I call the 12 truths. And if you follow these truths, you will have success. This isn't a get rich quick scheme. I'm not trying to sell anything. I don't do seminars. You can't buy t-shirts with my face on it. This is just solid wisdom that uh, most people aren't exposed to. We go to school to learn how to be employees. Enough reading and writing and, you know, uh, like the old adage, the kid works at a big company and the boss shows up in a brand new Ferrari and the, the young kid is just uh, staring at him. And the boss goes, you like this car? He goes, yeah. If you work really, really hard next year, I'll be able to buy another one. <laughs> so wh why live your life making someone else's dream come true? So um, what made you pick this particular title? I mean, it's a very unusual... Well, well we're living in an era of endless innovation where you see hundred year old companies, you know, disappear overnight. Um, people that think that they have a stable, safe job at a stable, safe company, there is no security. And that secure, that illusion of security is robbing ambition. So what are the tools to make you future proof? I mean, I spent 10 years, you know, explaining to people by whether by choice or circumstance, everybody gets disrupted, every career gets disrupted. I don't have to preach that after the pandemic, right? And um, it's funny, about six years ago, when I was asked at, at, a, at, uh, at a major keynote, 
what would be the, the biggest disruption? I said, when, the pan, when we have a pandemic uh, globally and nobody, nobody knew what we were talking about. So how do you respond? So in the same time, the millions of people lost their job during the pandemic, the 100 wealthiest Americans doubled their net worth, not doubled what they earn in a year, doubled their net worth. And my two books are six years apart. When I wrote Disrupt You and talked about Elon Musk, he was worth $2 billion. Six years later, he's worth $220 billion. What is he doing differently? Every 32 hours, there's a self-made billionaire. I don't know what you did yesterday, Mark, but you're a slacker. Um, <laughs> so, so true. They have the same 24 hours in a day. They didn't go to better universities. They don't have higher IQs. They didn't come from connected families. They're looking at the world differently. They're looking at the obstacles in their lives as opportunities in disguise. Solve a problem for five people, you have friends. Solve for a million, you make wealth. Solve for a billion, you change the world. And we're so interconnected. We're one click away from billions of people. You only have to be right for a nanosecond to create wealth or to change the world. So please talk about the two keys to building great wealth. You mentioned in the book, uh, you mentioned the book and, and why you chose them along with giving some examples from successful entrepreneurs, because you've mentioned a bunch of them that you've worked with and, or at least observed. So you only need two things for success, insight and perseverance. Everything else can be hired. And you can, I can teach you how to get insight. I, I have a, a, a three problems a day for 30 days uh, technique where it's real simple. Wake up today and write down three problems in your life. But do that every day for a month. The first day, it's real easy. Oh, I hate traffic. I hate this. I hate that. By the time two or three days go by, you go, I don't have any more problems. Because we live our lives on autopilot. And we don't notice the moment by moment. Uh, one, of my, one of my readers who I've become friends with was doing this. And one day, he's taking his medicine in the morning, and the phone rings. And after the call, he goes, did I take my pill? Well, if I did and I take another one, that's not good. And if I didn't, I don't take a pill. That's not, oh, that's a problem. And he thought about it and eventually took a little happy meal, you know, 25 cent watch, put it on a pill bottle. When you open it, it says it was open X number of minutes ago. That became the timer cap. He sold millions and millions of them. Uh, a, a flight attendant realized that she was always fumbling around in her purse to find her keys. She made a little clasp that goes inside purses, became a millionaire in three months. And my favorite of how I've wasted my life compared to today's generation, uh, two years ago, a uh, 16-year-old girl in high school was doing her science fair. I did the typical baking soda and vinegar volcano. She said, wow, the number four leading cause of death is hospitals, getting an infection when you're in a hospital, not, not why you went in. What if, to make a long story short, sutures would change color if they were infected? So she played with vegetables and stuff around the house, was smart oh, enough. No, no doctors or scientists in the family. This was smart enough, having watched enough, I'm sure, Shark Tank to get a patent. And today, her thing's saving millions of lives around the world. And she's just starting her freshman year of college. So that, why that wouldn't- an amazing story. Why wouldn't you wanna do this? And so, you know, the first thing, the first truth in future-proofing you is to have a growth mindset. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So in the case of Vin, the, the young man that I mentored, how do you take somebody who was told his whole life he can't, that he lived in a, in a world that gave up on hope? And so I lied to him. I'm not proud of lying, but there's a technique called the Pygmalion effect. A uh, professor went to school, tested all the kids, and told the teachers these three students would be super achievers, super learners. And at the end of the year, when they test the whole school, those three kids excelled over everybody. But the professor lied. He just picked three names out of a hat. If you tell people they're special and you treat them special, they become special. So I told Vin, I interviewed over 100 candidates, and he was the only one that had all the attributes to be a self made millionaire. And they figured that this old successful guy thought that it must be true. When in fact, Ben was the only person I interviewed. 
And, you know, I, I was going to ask this question further down and, and we'll circle back to the questions I am uh, have listed here. But what did you learn from working uh, with him and what was the final outcome? Oh, you learn so much by mentoring and mentoring and, and getting mentors, a series of mentors is one of the 12 truths because you're going to have different stages. But the world he grew up in is a different world than I grew up in and a different time and a different generation. And, and different values. And there's no right or wrong to how we interpret the world, but we were raised that you work hard and someday you'll retire and travel or whatever. Whereas it's a generation that doesn't know that that future is going to be there. So why not enjoy life now? And with the pandemic finally proving that remote workers can work and are more productive and have less turnover, you're seeing a whole generation now that says, okay, why live in a small apartment and, and with roommates in Silicon Valley where, you know, I'm making good money, but I, I live like a pauper. I'll live a month in Thailand. I'll live a month in Costa Rica. I'll go to Hawaii for a month. I'll keep the same job, but why wait till you're nearly dead and gray hair to start living life? So I have a friend of mine. She did exactly what you're suggesting. And she's now lived in seven different countries and she has 25 people working for her and they're all remote and she is living her best life in her thirties and making, makes a lot of money doing exactly what you just said. Well, you heard about how many millions of people walked off their jobs this year and it caught everybody off guard because they had time during the pandemic to think of what's important. And the idea of spending an hour plus commuting to a job and an hour plus commuting with all that stress, so you come home and you're worn out and you're not giving your best to your loved ones, no wonder marriages aren't, aren't working. So you can really have it all if you focus on how to have it all. In your book, you read about uh, people with high IQs have the most instability why is that? It, it's what the research shows. So being smart doesn't make you rich. Um, in fact, if you talk to any uh, university chancellor or provost, they'll tell you it's the C students that endow the universities. Um, they tend to overthink things. They tend to be more risk averse. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons and I don't want to generalize it, but the research shows that you don't have to have super great brains. Now, you know, there are those that I've worked with that are, you know, if you ask me smartest person on the planet, I'd probably say Reid Hoffman, who created LinkedIn, uh, PayPal was the first check in Zuckerberg's hands for Facebook. I mean, on and on and on. The guy's just really smart. He thinks faster, better, but it doesn't take great intellect to solve a basic problem and get a product out to the masses. Well, what have you observed about Reed Hoffman? Because he is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the history of the country, the world. Well, when we were, he was give, given an award at some, some dinner. And uh, one of the things that, 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 that we shared that was amazing is I've invested, I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars for startups and invested in tons of companies. And every business plan that somebody does that has, here's what our growth's going to be, you know, every business is going to make money in year five, right? They're all just pulled out of their, their you know, thin air. They're, nobody's numbers are real and you don't expect them. To but we put up LinkedIn's first five years uh, numbers in, in, in users and in revenue. And we overlaid it with his business plan and it was a glove. They were identical. So the guy sees into the future with a, an analytic mind that's just better than others. And he's a wonderful personality. I mean, zero ego. And it, when he had to become a public figure that he had to put himself out there and learn how to be a public figure. Uh, I was uh, surprised uh, reading, getting a degree, and you wrote this in your book, getting a degree from a major university doesn't have a positive impact. As true as that 
for most uh, degrees or which ones are not really valuable or which ones are valuable? Well, there's been two generations that have been just pummeled with, you got to go to college, got to go to college, got to go to college. I gave a keynote to uh, the National Trade Organization two weeks ago that maintains our power lines, right? Without electricity, life's going to suck. They can't get workers because it's, a, it's looked down upon to have a, a trade and a skill when their workers start at six figures, right? So it depends what you want to be. One of my best friends wanted to be a dentist. Well, you're going to have to go to college for that. You may not have to go to college for other things. So there's no, there's no, but, you know, getting a basket weaving degree and graduating with a mortgage, but no house actually makes you risk adverse. You have all this debt. So you have to take a job. You can't start a company when, if you didn't have any debt, you could try things because most likely you're going to fail. But when you fail, you don't end up where you started. You either earn or you learn, but either way, it propels you <laughs> forward. Walt Disney's first company, Belly Up. Uh, Henry Ford's first company, Belly Up. Two guys I worked with in the beginning of my career had a brilliant idea. What if you synchronize traffic lights with a computer? Reduced urban traffic. It was called Trafo Data. City planners had no idea what they were talking about. So Bill Gates and Paul Allen's first company went bust. The second company, Microsoft did a little bit better. They made $16,000 the first year. So you learn from failing. But if you don't get the opportunity to fail, you don't get the opportunity to learn. What's your methodology for determining if one's idea has potential? Because I've done a lot of ventures and I thought some of them had great potential and talked to the uh, potential buyers and so forth. And believe that that was the case and it didn't turn out that way. So what's your methodology for determining if one's idea has potential? So you have to go to real customers and see, would they spend the money? And if they wouldn't ask them why more entrepreneurs are ruined um, by compliments. Um, you know, don't ask your grandmother. She's going to think it's a great idea, but Will people pay? What will they pay? I'm chairman of a company that is making robots to replace pesticides. Short version is somebody 100 years ago thought the greatest way to grow food was to slather with enough poison to kill everybody but us. <laughs> Turns out that but us wasn't exactly accurate. Um, and life expectancy in America is going down. Um, so what if little robots could go up and down the, the corn fields, the wheat fields, the soy, the milo, and just cut out the weeds? Well, now you don't need herbicides. You don't need Roundup. You don't need cancer stuff. Your stuff's organic. Farmers make 40% more per acre. But it's robots. This is like, do people want robots? How do you? And so by going and talking to farmers and signing up farmers and learning, you know, we realized we're not going to sell robots. We're going to be robots as a service. A truck pulls up, the robots drive themselves off, they go up and down, they do their thing and they leave. And it's less than the cost of pesticides with no capital expenditure. So we learn that from the customer. Have you ever done a venture where people told you they need it and then you executed on it and it turned out they didn't really want it after all that they basically told you told you those things because hey they didn't want to hurt your feelings or they thought they needed it at the time but no. once they finally saw it they didn't want it and what no, be, no because you're going out and finding real customers with real needs and uh, a minimal viable product as, as quickly as you can and the reasons why a business would usually fail is you mismatched your pricing to the need someone else executed better, the first person you're going to educate in business is your competition. And so there's somebody that's sleeping that uh, you awaken by showing what you should do. So, um, but yeah, to, to, to mismatch a market, you really then didn't line up customers before you spent the money. We have a question from the audience. Uh, college and employment is a big issue for people who are neurodiverse. Do you have any thoughts on how, to, uh, how life can change for this community in the post-COVID world when there may be more flexibility both 
on uh, college and employment? Well, I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a doctor or scientist, but I'll tell you this: many of the biggest uh, employers now, the biggest tech companies, the Googles and whatever, no longer require college on your on the application. So for years, resumes were instantly sorted. If you didn't have the college degree or you didn't have the MBA or whatever they, they made the bar, they didn't look at candidates. I, I worked uh, with a company that hires around 20,000 people a year. And most people never get a human interview. They flip through the resumes, uh, optical character recognition software reads them and they get a smaller pile. And I said, I got a better system. No one should get a human interview. And they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, hear me out. Humans are horrible interviewers. We hire people that we like. We hire people that are like us, which instantly limits diversity, personalities, all kinds of stuff, multiculturalism. We're biased, we're, we're racist, whatever it might be. We also don't know what questions make you pick good employees. So if a computer was doing it and it was automated and it was a chat bot, you might find out asking a person, do you have a dog is a more valid question than what university went to. Of course, you could analyze over a year which employees lasted longer. You know, your, your top three places people wanna go, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and they get the best of the best from the top universities. Average tenure, less than two years. So human interviewing doesn't work and, and that'll open up for, for, for a, a wider berth. For millennia, we had to hire the best people within walking distance or driving distance. Now we can hire the best people in the world and they may be willing to work for substantially less. We have another question from the audience. Are there any habits, mindsets, mentalities that you have developed that have had the biggest impact on your success? Oh, great question. Yeah. So, so as I talked about having growth mindset, I wake up every morning and when I look in the mirror, after I get over the shock that I'm actually old, I'm still 15 in my mind. Yeah. Um, there's two things that I say to myself. Today can be better than yesterday. And I have the power to make it so. And as trite and hippie and tree hugging as that sounds, it actually lights up the neurons, the synaptic nerves, releases dopamine put you in a better mood, makes you friendlier, more likable, better salesperson, whatever it might be. So you control you. You can't control anything else in the world. So having that positive mindset will take you so far. Um, and tons of studies on, on what separates the difference between kids that achieve and kids, kids that don't is a growth mindset. When they fail a test, they don't say, I'm stupid, I failed a test. They say, I should have studied harder. Is there a better way to be first to the party as a disruptor or arrive later when people are already educated about the market? Hence, a little competition could be good. Uh, I look at Airbnb, Google, Amazon, Facebook. None of those folks were first, but they're all the dominant players in their space. In fact, they weren't even second or third. What's your take on that? It's impossible to time the market, right? Um, uh, we're using a technology called Zoom. This technology was invented by a company called Ubu that I was president of that was the first to allow multi people to talk on mobile and do all kinds of stuff. We didn't have a pandemic um, to propel the business <laughs> to billion dollar status. So you don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I'll tell you this. As soon as you have something that's a good idea, that's when you should act on it, right? If it turns out you're too early, all that that means is you're gonna to have to be really good at raising capital to have the capital when the market catches up. But to come in second, you're gonna need even more capital. Why do you write, it isn't important to be an expert before pursuing an idea, which I personally agree with and have experienced? Um, so, so let me, let me answer this with, with my actual life. So I got out of college and for those listening, I'm old. Um, but when I was in college, this new movie had just come out called star Wars. It was life-changing. It was amazing. And so I said, I want to go into Hollywood and do special effects. Couple, couple problems there. 
I knew nothing about Hollywood, knew nothing about special effects, but that shouldn't stop me. I made up a business card for $1. My company was called Jasmine. My initials, J on Salmon, it was mine. And I knew enough that no one was going to go and hire a 21-year-old to do the special effects on the feature film. So I made myself a sales guy at this mythical company, and I went out and I hustled. And the second I got the first piece of business, then I could hire the experts to do the work. Remember, you need insight and perseverance. Everything else can be hired. And so I've built lottery machines. I've built the first online auction. I've, I, I've, I've built tons of stuff. I'm not an engineer. When I said I built, it was my company, my team. I do nothing. What would you say your greatest strength is and why you've been successful? So as a child in Philadelphia, it turns out I was dyslexic. When they had reading groups, there was the eagles, the hawks, and the mud hens, you know? They don't expect a lot from a mud hen growing up. So I was so embarrassed by this that when they would do group assignments, I raised my hand first so I could delegate the things that I didn't know how to do. Turns out, great training for being an entrepreneur. So I'm a lousy employee, but I'm really good at getting people to do their best stuff. And so you end up doing that. I've been brought into turnaround companies with hundreds of thousands of people. And I've sat in an empty room and started a company from scratch, but it's really about getting people and empowering them to do their best work. So, but it seems like you've got great people skills and you also have a, a real understanding and even empathy for people. What, what kind of skills did it actually take to be you? Now you're asking for therapy. Um, don't know. I mean, I, I don't have that, that uh, I know it all type attitude. So you have to be open to input. You go to a big giant company, you know, when I was running Sony, we all understood what the iPod meant or whatever, but nobody would talk to higher management type stuff. And, you know, everybody had their own little fight them. I was brought in to shake that up. So, so many people have brilliant ideas for the companies they work for. They could become an entrepreneur. They could change things from within. Um, but people are either afraid of rejection or have fear. One of my, one of my 12 truths is to harness fear. I hate on many podcasts out there when people of power say fear isn't real, fear is make believe, you can conquer fear. BS, not true, farthest thing from the truth. We are hardwired, our lizard brain, at the core of our brain has a fight or flight response. The first time you see somebody, are they gonna attack me, eat me? You know. You can't get past that. Rational thought is way down on the list. So you're walking around, you're afraid to lose your job. You're afraid to lose your money. You're afraid to lose investors' money. You're afraid, you're afraid, you're afraid. But imagine for a second, you're walking down the street in a big 18-wheel semi, loaded with sharks and bees for some strange reason. The brakes are out, it's coming and careening towards you. What do you do? Do you think about your fear of your business and your fear of losing money. No, you jump out of the way, the fear of losing your life. So you can prioritize fears. So if you're at a job that isn't fulfilling, isn't letting you live at the style that you want to, isn't allowing you to treat your family the way they deserve, well, you trade a day of your life, a week of your life, a year of your life. One day you're gonna wake up and you gave up the most precious thing. You gave away your life, just like that truck. For what? I don't believe in reincarnation. If you do, you got more shots at this than I do. <laughs> so why would you give up this precious thing in days and hours in something that isn't there for you? And if you keep that fear omnipresent, those other fears are so far down the list. You were, you've been talking about the, was it 12, 12 feet, uh, 12, truths. 12 truths. Do you want to briefly tell us what those are? Well, it, it takes a lot out to just 
go through the list, but but harnessing fear is a major a major one. Um, one of the, the the things that I overlooked in disrupt you that really I realized uh, was an oversight. That's one of the twelve truths is don't fly solo. You're going to need mentors. You know, Oprah Winfrey had Barbara Walters. I mean, you can go through almost everybody. Zuckerberg had Steve Jobs. There are, everybody can learn anything with enough time, but why not shorten that time? And I teach people how to go on LinkedIn and find those mentors. And no, you don't just write somebody out of the blue, will you be my mentor? That's like walking to bar and going, hey, will you have my baby? I don't think it works, okay? But how to engage people, because people are writing things, people are putting themselves out there, people are speaking in conferences because they want to help others. It's not a zero sum game. And that's something that we learned wrong in school. Most people look at business as there's only so much money. If you get it, then I don't get it. If you get the promotion, then I don't get it. You know, it's this dog eat dog, it's a miserable existence. But that's not where wealth is created. That's not where these billionaires aren't taking money from somebody else. They're literally creating money from thin air. My last company sold for $200 million. If I told you I was starting a new one and Mark, I'd sell you 10% for $10,000 and you gave me $10,000, what do I now have? I have 90,000 in stock that I created in thin air and I have 10,000 in cash. I can hire people with the stock. I can, I can buy companies with that stock. So. It's not a zero sum game. Mentors understand this. They, they want the validation that what they've learned has value. So if somebody wants you as a mentor, what do they do? Um, so the people that have been successful have been people that have had uh, a startup far enough along that solves a major world problem that I have the unique set of skills or relationships that could accelerate that. And then I say, yes. Um, but if it's just, hey, I've got this business that's going to make a bunch of money, I don't need any money. So that's not a motivator for me. So here's a question from the audience. What's a blind spot that changed the trajectory of your body of work? And then what's the one blind spot that you see entrepreneurs have in scaling their business? Great question. So I had a blind spot that took me 20 years. I, I remember I had a, a digital solution for, for, for Pepsi. I won't tell the whole story, but flew in a meeting, the global CEO, Armok, New York. And this is a while ago. I'm walking down the hallway and I realize every desk has an IBM Selectrix. Nobody has PCs. I'm going, this is going to be a really short meeting. <laughs> and I left there with, why don't they get it? And for years, you know, I pitched McDonald's about having touchscreens back in the 80s. I mean, why don't they get it? And then one day it dawned on me, people that made it to the C-suite, the corner office, they don't need to get it. They, they feel that they've achieved. It's your job to communicate in a way that those in the past can understand the future. And once I put the onus on me, my career catapulted. Um, most entrepreneurs do have blind spots, but there's not a universal blind spot. It depends how you came to it. So when I teach at the graduate school level, I put business teams together of, of engineers and, and, and MBAs. And the MBAs have this brilliant business idea and they think they've got it all figured out. And when you put them in front of an engineer who wants to build it, they can't communicate what it is that, that you want to build. They just have an idea of a business problem. The flip side is engineers can build amazing things, but don't understand many times a world that is irrational, that makes decisions not on data, but on impulse feeling and a bunch of other reasons. So it, it's, it's more about always put yourself in the other person's uh, seat and know that that person has their fears and you can exploit those fears to get them to understand what you're doing. Another question from the audience. You're great at bringing out the best in a person. How do you get groups of these individuals to work together as a high functioning group or company? The 100,000 people company you turned around. Um, so I've had big companies that have turned around. I have companies that 
I was unsuccessful turning around. Um, it's really about aligning <coughs> motivation. So with my first startup, with any, with any startup, you actually have more time than capital. So each year I would sit down all the employees and say, using our skill set, what's some charity that we can do something for this year? We couldn't write a check to somebody, but we designed the first handicap software. We designed stuff for museums. And when I bump into people years later, they don't remember what they got paid this or that, but they remember those projects because they were meaningful to them. So find a greater good. For too many years, cause marketing was a throwaway line. But when you think of something like Tom's shoes, that for every person that buys a pair, someone that's never had shoes gets a pair. How do you think that makes employees feel? They have a, they, they're bought in to the mission. And I believe that the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose. So if you can put a purpose greater than the bottom line, your people will coalesce. If it's all about making you rich, really tough to keep that motivation once people have the money. How do you find, and this is another question from the audience, how do you find increase your chances of finding the best people to help you execute your vision? What are some of the best ways to empower your team and the people you work with? Um, first of all, be out there. Meet as many people in your field as you can. And you'll find great people at all kinds of companies that are frustrated and don't feel valued and aren't necessarily looking to be paid more. You know, the, the number one reason people leave a job isn't money. And, and most bosses don't seem to understand that. Are you valued? Are you challenged? You know, or are you just told to do something and shut up? So the more people you can meet, and then when you get to, you know, specific skill sets, you know, you know, LinkedIn is a great school tool for finding the best of the best and where they are. And then reaching out and seeing if you can, uh, you know, have a meeting of the mind, so to speak. One, one, I, a startup pitched me, this has got to be, I don't know, 20 years ago. Worst idea ever. But the, the woman that was pitching was brilliant, answered questions brilliantly. So at the end of the pitch, I said, oh, could, could you just wait here for one minute after, after a team leaves? I shut the door and I go, what would it take for you to leave that company and come work for me today. She laughed and she didn't, but we've been best friends ever since. And she's gone on to be a star in Silicon Valley. You know, shining stars are bright, but a big idea will attract moths like to a flame. When I sold my first company and the internet had finally caught on, I realized that it could finally give equal access to knowledge. So if you remember Brown versus the school. Yeah you know, that separate but equal schools. Well, there were poor neighborhoods with horrible schools because schools were paid for by property taxes. So poor neighborhoods didn't have maps to them. This, if every classroom could have the internet, there could be equal access to knowledge. So I started writing about this. One day I get a call from the president of the United States. Now this isn't Jay now, this is Jay barely in his thirties. And I embarrassed myself by making uh, Bill Clinton prove he was Bill Clinton because why would the president be calling me? Um, and he wanted me to go do this. I don't know how to wire all the schools. I don't know how to do And by the way, there's not a penny in, in, in government funding. Make a long story short, 18 months later, it was done. The big idea attracts big minds. And one of the, the payoff moments for this was a press event where the president and vice president came out to school, this before Wi-Fi, to pull wires and wire a school and, and, and get a bunch of positive PR. And so the White House photographer took a bunch of pictures. And a few weeks later, I get a signed picture from the president with me, the president, and this other guy. And yeah, my ego was a little hurt. Why couldn't it be a two shot? You know, who's this other guy? It was one other volunteer. Years go by and it's hanging in my office. People go, oh, you know, Eric Schmidt? Mm -hmm. After being a volunteer that was out of work, he went on to be chairman of Google. Um, so the number of people that have come into my life, if you remember the old movie Zelig, is just because I'm attracted to big ideas of others 
and I, and I work on, on big ideas that excite me. And you get to meet amazing people. 10 years before Facebook, I had a million member uh, uh, social network that we created called Animal House. Uh, for college kids. It was the first thing to, 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 to take off in that community. And we knew college kids wanted to have sports. And there was a startup that wanted to uh, broadcast college games. So running the sports was a young kid named Mark Cuban. I mean, the number of people that went on to become billionaires, it, it just is staggering, which showed me that it was achievable for, for anybody willing to work for it. What's the differences um, between a mixed and a growth mindset? And please explain the six, six techniques for developing a growth mindset. So there's a whole chapter, chapter on it, um, but it really comes down to it at, at, at the beginning is starting to phrase and, and that change that inner dialogue that you have, that inner dialogue that stops you the more aware you are of something saying, I can't do that, or I, 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 I failed or whatever, and changing how you, how you think about it. What could you have done differently? What will you do differently? How will you get past? Because it's like a baby doesn't stand up one day and go, today I shall walk across the room. They get up, they fall, they get up, they fall, they figure it out. When you play video games, you hit that immovable object that, that, that's in your way and you hammer at it for hours, and you finally figure out how to get past it just to discover that there's another one. Well, that's what being an entrepreneur is like. You're going to have a series of these things. And if, if you recognize that when you're backed in a corner, there is a way out. For me, I didn't set out to be an entrepreneur. I didn't set out to do anything. I had my kids when I was very young, and I wanted my two young sons to have a good life. And that kept me from ever saying quit. I noticed in your story about uh, Vin, or at least it appeared this way, that Vin seemed to be working on like 24 seven. Can a person achieve great financial success and have work-life balance? Did you manage to achieve that? So for the artificial goal in my mind of could I take somebody from zero to a million in under a year, this was not about life balance. This was about you, you, you prospect all day and you work all night and you're gonna see, have no dating, no movies, no television, nothing for a year. And the only thing that kept him going to finish out the year because he hit the million early um, was he knew and he'd already booked in his mind that the next year he was taking off. He was going to take what some of what he made and travel the world and enjoy life because he knew he was future proof. Again, where the title came from, that he could start anytime a new company and do it again. So the book isn't about work life balance. Now, work life balance, obviously important. So you have to figure out what's important to you. But there is a psychological principle that they've tested called the marshmallow test. They still do it, it's been done for 60 years. Nothing predicts success better than the marshmallow test. You take a little three-year-old and you sit them in a room with no distractions, a little white room, and you put two marshmallows, two Oreos, it doesn't make it different, put one, one, one marshmallow in the room. And you say, I have to go do something. But if you, you can have the marshmallow now, but if you wait until I come back, I'll give you another one. And the kids that can delay gratification end up having a higher graduation room, higher uh, uh, marriage success rate, higher lifetime earnings. And they've studied this in all kinds of things in all kinds of cultures. Um, so the point of this is you have to be willing to delay some of that work-life balance. Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, Bill Gates, didn't take any vacations or days off in their 20s. You may say that's obsessive. Yes, it is but their goals were miles beyond the reach of most people. Elon Musk, when he sold his first company and had hundreds of thousands, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars, he was completely broke within a year, not because he lost it all, because he invested it to start three new companies. 
he was driven by that. So find your own balance. I mean, for me, nowadays we think of people working from the home. When I started my first company, I wanted to be with my kids till they got to school. So I ran my first company out of my house and we played a game when the phone rang, who could stay quiet the longest, got a prize and the kids were part of it. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's twice as hard due to historical pressures on women to have that balance because they also have a biological clock at which, you know, having kids stops. So no one has it without trade-offs. And there's nobody out there that is just this easy, perfect balance. You, you uh, alluded to before that you've had some failures yourself. What, what was your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? So biggest, it depends what you put that in category. Uh, you know, financially, biggest was probably $9 billion, but I didn't know it was that at the time. Somebody offered to buy my company for a third of their company. Um, and, uh, but each failure, you learn different lessons. The one that I start off to disrupt you with uh, was probably the most devastating at the time. Uh, the California lottery was coming to California for the first time, and they wanted to have a machine where people could get their own tickets. Um, so the competition had this little thing with the green screen that showed the little numbers when you hit the keypad and printed out a ticket. I, on the other hand, made a motion activated thing with a whole color thing that when you walk by it goes, Psst, what would you do with a million dollars and showed you all kinds of videos and you communicate with eight languages. It was, it was heads and shoulders should have won. And I didn't know how to raise money back then. I was a young kid starting out. It was done on a bunch of credit cards and I was maxed <laughs> out and I was broke and this was going to be everything. And I went up to Sacramento and what I didn't know and later would find out in court was that the competition was uh, videotaped giving a suitcase of cash to a state senator who went to prison um, to get the votes. So I didn't get the contract, they got the contract. The senator goes to prison, but they still got to keep the contract. So anyway, I'm leaving this room trying to figure out how this horrible thing won and I'm now broke. I get back to LAX. I do not have enough money to take a cab home. My credit cards are maxed out, I can't use those. LA isn't a city that has buses that anybody that isn't Einstein could figure out. And they used to have these tables, these booths manned by nice little old ladies that would tell you how to get to this and that for tourists. But it was late at night, they were gone. I'm at the rock bottom low. What am I, mean, I can't face my kids, I can't face anything. I was sure this was my ticket. And then I'm sitting there, wait a second. Lots of people need to figure out how to get around LA. People come from all over the world speaking all kinds of languages. Little old ladies don't work 24 seven. I have this amazing kiosk that can do all that. So next time you get your tickets at an airport, think of me in that moment. It was that moment of being rock bottom where I said, I've got another use for this. I, I can pivot. Twitter was a music service. Um, the number of businesses that have, 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 have pivoted. One of my favorites was when broadband came along, there had already been computer dating. For those that just moved their thumb, it used to be you see a still picture, you type, send emails back and forth. But with broadband, you could have videos. So there was a company called TuneIn Hookup that was going to let people upload videos so you could talk, see their personality. They were going to make a fortune. Brilliant site, easy interface, phenomenal. One problem to their business plan. No one wanted to date these losers. So the first video <laughs> was a guy at the zoo in front of the elephant explaining why you should go out with them. But they looked at the data. Data doesn't lie, it doesn't have an ego. And they noticed something that wasn't in their business plan because they'd gone farther into this business than anybody else. No one wanted to date these people, but they sure as heck wanted to show their friends how bad the dating pool was and share the videos. So at the end of the first year, they changed the name of TuneIn Hookup to YouTube and became billionaires without a penny in revenue. Wow. So here's a question from the audience. How do you find and increase your chances of finding the best people to help execute your vision? 
what are some of the best ways to empower your team and the people you work with? Clearly, you've been very good at this. Well, shut up and get out of your way. Um, uh, Bill Gates had a great line that I, I don't think he uses anymore. Like, Hire lazy people to find the quickest way to get things done. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's really, if you can communicate clearly what the mission is, what the purpose is, it will attract people that are attracted to the purpose, not because you're paying them more than somebody else. You know, one of the dark downsides of Silicon Valley is there's always somebody with more money to hire away the best and brightest. And many will go there. But the dissatisfaction rate that I told you about people that just feel like they're a cog in a wheel is so high that you can get great people. So be clear on your messaging, be clear on the mission, and be clear on how important they will be to making that happen. The other trick I use is I have never walked into a meeting and said, I have an idea. I have a half an idea. I need the rest of the people to make it a, a better idea, to, to fill it out. I, I'm very good at going, here's where we are, here's where we need to be. I kind of mentally skip all the steps in the middle, but there's people that are really good at those steps. Let them do what they do. I've tried to do tons of tasks to just be the nice boss helping out. And pretty much I get fired from every team that I put myself on because, you know, we appreciate the energy, but you're, you're not an expert at, at that skill set. Um, my special effects company used to do special effects by hand painting cells. And we were behind on the Superman movie doing lightning. And so I said, these guys are wait, staying up through the night. I'll do some with them. They finally said, you know, you're costing us more work by having to redo your work. Just go home, boss. Um, but, you know. I've been blessed by just having amazing people. And most people are amazing because most tasks don't take, you know, Einstein to do. But if, if you're not letting people put what they want into it and you're trying to micromanage, and that's a big problem of a lot of, a lot of uh, startups want to hire, you know, just straight A students because they were the straight A student or, you know, the best of the best. You really have to learn how to work with C students. And yes, everybody you hire might not be up to your level, but you can only, if you took a test, you can only get a score of 100. Three C students, each getting 70 would be 210. They're <laughs> outscoring you. That's what managing is. I think very, very smart. How did you raise your kids? Um, you know, what tools did you give them that they've turned out very successful? Did you just give a little background about your own children, because I think people wonder, how does a successful entrepreneur impart these kinds of skills on their own kids? Well, my kids hate when I talk about uh, them, them publicly. Uh, but yeah, uh, both very successful, successful Hollywood screenwriter, very successful Hollywood uh, executive. Um, my son's had a bunch of hit TV shows and movies. Um, the biggest thing that you don't want to do with a kid is say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because that implies that you only get to be one thing. I always asked, what problem do you want to solve when you grow up? Because at each stage of life, you're going to see different injustices that bother you. Things that you would like to fix in the world. And if you can start with that attitude. And so... My, my, my son that became the comedy writer, I'm not a sports guy. When he was five, he got his little t-ball uniform and I took him out to the field and he was all excited to wear the uniform and I explained the game and showed everything and he was all excited. And then he saw the other team show up. So he goes, so daddy, if I let them win, then everybody's happy? <laughs> he was born to do what he does. It wasn't about being competitive. So, you know, listen to their, their dreams and just throw everything at them and, and what sticks, sticks. You talk about uh, seven steps to solving, uh, to problem solving. What are, the couple, what are the two, three most important steps or what's the most important step to solving a problem? 
Um, you can read all that stuff. That's, that's, that's boring to go through for people on, on, on a call. Um, but the key is to do everything with a process. And that way you can take some of the emotionality out of solving problems. What about brainstorming? Because a lot of people do very structured brainstorming. What, what do you do when you do brainstorming with your teams or, or even for yourself? Um, so uh, the, the blue ocean approach, there's a lot of different approaches and I've been brought in by, by governments with some real problems. The, the main thing is to keep all the communication open, not to shut somebody down. The second it's, you know, that's a dumb idea or we tried that or whatever that stops everybody else from speaking out loud. So you really wanna, but again, a brainstorming isn't as unstructured. It starts with what is it that we're trying to solve? And if you can communicate that, and you know, some organizations just can't get out of their way because of the politics and the fiefdoms within them. And I mean, I've been brought in on huge companies facing, you know, existential problems, you know, multi-billion dollar companies that just can't seem to, can't seem to make an electric car or whatever they should be doing. And it always usually comes down to ego. So brainstorming, you got to check the ego at the door. You said everyone has a superpower. How does one identify their superpower and take advantage of it? Yeah. So Friends, relatives come to you for advice. What are they asking about? What, what is it that they've identified? Because they all like you for a reason and, and you have something. And uh, no one's coming to me for fashion advice, right? <laughs> no, just once in my career, I'd like a CEO to call and say, Jay, we've just had our best year. We want you to come in and make it better. No. Once they've turned over all the cards and go, oh my God, <laughs> we've tried everything. Well, let's call Samet. Um, so my superpower was, was solving those types of, of, of problems, but what do people ask you for? What is it? Is it your personality? Is it, is it, is it how you communicate, you know, and then lean into that skill set as what is the cornerstone of, of, of your business? Here's my last question for you. Being an entrepreneur is tough. <clears throat> there's a lot of a lot of pain that one goes through how do you get over the tough times and how do you remain passionate how do you maintain that passion during the down times yeah so um it's lonely it's depressing it's uh you know all of those things <laughs> and that goes back to purpose you know having purpose will give you the perseverance to go through because you don't want to, I did not want to let down the president of the United States and all the school children. I had to figure out how to solve the problem. I did not want to let down my kids. You know, the secret to happiness is to solve for others. Entrepreneurs are the same thing. Entrepreneurs don't sell things. They solve things. No one ever went into a hardware store to buy a quarter inch drill bit. What they wanted was a quarter inch hole. They had to buy the drill bit to get the hole. So the more that you think of your business as who are you solving for? You know, I'm sure you get a lot of business books that want you to write a blurb or whatever. And I'm always amazed at how many people wrote a book for their own edification, as opposed to who are you solving for? Who are you helping? And so if your business isn't solving, and it can be the most thing. I, I, have a, I have a friend who recently sold his company for over 100 mil in the blinds, the window shades business. <coughs> well, you could say, well, it's solving for sunlight. No, there was a whole industry before him, but tons of little kids get caught in the, in the cord and, and strangle and die. So he decided to build a company around cordless blinds. He was passionate about solving that issue. That differentiated it from everything else. Jay, 
The book was great. You were fantastic. I'm sure these people could spend the rest of the day listening to you talk about these different topics. I hope you're going to write another one after this book. Sounds like you have a lot of books left in you. So a uh, quick thing for those that stayed in this long and want to get started. On my website, I don't sell anything. I have free workbooks, companion workbooks. So it's each chapter. You can do little exercises and start formulating your business. So my website's just my name, jsamet.com. So um, I wish you all great success and look forward to the problems that you solve. Jay, thanks again. And good to run into you after like 50 plus years. <laughs> Terrific. Made my day. Have a good one. You as well. Everyone have a great weekend. We hope to see you all next week as well.